continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. And however over the years I've chosen to characterize today's guest by way of introducing him so many times to our viewers, a man for all intellectual seasons may be my favorite. Yet I couldn't possibly do better in looking to someone else's artful phrasing concerning my guest than by going back a quarter century and quoting the very opening sentence of his compelling 1986 New Yorker profile by that late wonderful writer, Philip Hamburger. The New York Public Library houses many treasures, Hamburger wrote, but few are as colorful, complex, and enigmatic, civilized and stimulating as Vartan Gregorian, its president and chief executive officer. Now that was then, of course, this is now. And having earlier taught at Stanford, the University of Texas, and the University of Pennsylvania, my guest went on from the New York Public Library to be president of Brown University and almost 15 years ago to become president of the prestigious Carnegie Corporation of New York, itself now very much into celebrating its centennial as prime among America's great foundations. Now, I've told Vartan Gregorian that in this first of perhaps several programs marking Andrew Carnegie's formative foundation gifts of a century ago, I would like first to engage him in the very essence and meaning of foundations themselves, somewhat as John Henry Cardinal Newman so very long ago and Clark Kerr not so very long ago respectively discoursed on the idea and the uses of a university. First though, full disclosure. Over the years, Carnegie Corporation of New York has been quite generous to this program, as well as to the very idea of keeping an open mind on the air. Also, Vartan Gregorian recently added a charming and learned up-to-date afterward to my 1956 abridged edition of Tocqueville's Democracy in America. But now let me turn to Dr. Gregorian and ask him why a foundation? What was Andrew Carnegie thinking about in giving all of this money and was he right? Well, what you have in the 19th century, we have for the first time the modern foundation. We have had very charitable organizations, church related, but nothing secular foundation looking forward to solve problems, to invest in institutions, rather than maybe act for charity. The Comprehend Modern Foundation want to understand that there was differentiation made between charity, which all religions demand it, advise it, and preach about it, and foundation, which planned way is trying to cope with the solution provide solutions that have created misery, illness, and other ignorance, which charity tries to cope with or to save a solace. There's difference between pity and sympathy and rational investment in solving societal problems. That marked foundation concept. Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller were the first ones to approach it as scientific philanthropy. 
rather than giving charity. Philanthropy and foundations go hand in hand because what they try to do is to study, to invest, and to find solutions so that the rest of society can emulate, governments can emulate. When Andrew Carnegie started his foundation, he was involved. He did not do out of guilt. He did not do it out of vanity. He was fortunate enough, and most foundations, people who create the modern foundations, were from humble origins. So they were not doing as representative of a capitalist class, and they were not doing out of guilt or out of craving for immortality. They thought they were fortunate enough to be rich, that that would welcome responsibility. It's why the Bible said to those, much is given, much is expected. But instead of giving it as a sympathy, so when you give to a person is hungry, give fish, but give a fishing rod. Because the purpose of philanthropy is not to make people in, dep dependent, but rather than independent. And to provide models of solutions, rational, scientific, whatever was available, commonsensical, idealistic, but commonsensical and practical solutions for many of the problems. And so Andrew Carnegie was fortunate enough to become very rich, also fortunate enough to have ideas how to invest that. In many ways, he wanted to be apply laws of reason to laws of giving, hence foundations, modern foundations. To laws of giving or to laws of getting? To laws of giving, and after you give, you also get results. And uh, he was a maverick capitalist. In many what ways. do you mean a maverick capitalist? Maverick because uh, his ideas were revolutionary that uh, such pronouncements even today shock people. Aristocracy is like potatoes, the best part is underground. Don't brag about your ancestors. Who are you? What do you do? What do you do to deserve your ancestors? What are you doing to become an ancestor in the making? To learn. Second, that uh, Trustees of capitalists are trustees of public wealth, and you have to reinvest. Hence, the line, those who die rich, person who dies rich, dies disgraced, who did not have the imagination and desire, the humanity, re re reason, aspiration, ideally, to reinvest in society. This are these sort of 1890s, dramatically, revolutionary ideas at the time. You said Rockefeller and Carnegie. Yes. Uh, is this an American phenomenon? Foundation, modern foundations, dealing with societal issues, a modern phenomenon. Uh, several years ago, I was asked to give a lecture at NYU to 25, 30 university presidents from Europe and elsewhere about fundraising. And as I spoke, President of University of Amsterdam said, you're saying something which is illegal. I cannot go raise private funding in Amsterdam. It's against the law. Government obligation is to take care of education, culture, health, and others, not private sectors. So he was telling me something that not much is left in Europe for private volunteer local organization, volunteer, civil, civil society, but it's governmental obligation. So similarly, when I went to Mexico to give a talk to Mexican millionaires, I learned for the first time that philanthropy is a bad word in many ways if public private sector wants to do it because lover of humanity is the state. Charity belongs to uh, the private sector not philanthropy, because when Mexico and others uh, got rid of Spanish, other countries uh, got rid of Spanish rule, along with it, the church was downsized and minimized its role in order not to interfere in state's affairs. So philanthropos there is applied to the state's obligation rather than uh, private sectors now, of the church. Now, as you tell me this, Vartan, you're smiling. You're, you're telling... 
a good story. Yeah. But what occurs to me when I think of health care yes. and that I've learned that health care is better and greater in other parts of the world where I gather the state provides it, is this totally a good thing, this notion of uh, the state is the good guy? Yes, well, that's the, that's the irony of it. You know, some of this, uh, uh, the other day I was talking to someone about tenure. That awful. That awful word. Uh, and I said, you know, we owe it to Bismarck. So what are we talking about? Bismarck wanted civil service of Prussia and later Germany to be independent continuing body. So whatever government comes, you don't replace all the civil servants and so forth through patronage. He wanted a body of people, an institution, which will keep their role independent of governments coming and going. So he made professors part of civil service. And civil service had also social security. We owe age 65 to Bismarck because not too many people live to be 65. So we're guaranteed, uh, I'm being facetious now, so that was settled by Social Security. So it's not a radical idea, it was a conservative idea to provide cohesion of society together. And, and so in a sense, what I'm saying, European tradition, coming from French Revolution on, some of the issues that we're debating were resolved after that, from French Revolution to Napoleon. When Napoleon came, you can have church, uh, religious schools side by side with secular schools. It did not matter, but you had to pass one examination, state examination in order to get a degree in entire France. The state was accrediting you. We could not have, we have all kinds of local and regional accrediting committees and so on, we know national norms. But France resolved, I'm trying to say, religious schools and uh, secular schools by making state validator of their quality of their education. But the question that I would ask you, I, I don't mean to put you in an uncomfortable position yes. as the president of yes. this great foundation. Uh, does it take away, in a sense, the matter of private philanthropy in this country, foundations, yes. great foundations with great wealth and great things mm -hmm. that they accomplish? Mm -hmm. Does it mean that the state has to do less than it should be doing, than it, less than it is doing in other parts well, of the world? Well, we are, uh, that's a very good observation. We have been caught in two traditions. When uh, your man, uh, the talk we visited the United States, the role of federal state was minimal. Everything was local, and he admired that. The spirit of voluntarism. Many, many organizations, right after American Revolution, there were tens, if not hundreds of local groups, associations, and so on. So much so that George Washington, in his farewell address, complained about those organizations will not be responsible to any government. Oh, they're working on that. But we're no longer agrarian alone. We're urban. We're no longer 13, 20 million. We are 350 million. We fought two world wars, not to mention others became superpower. So the role of state has increased, but so has the priv private sector. One of the things you were asking about foundations, their centrality, today we have 1.6 million nonprofit institutions in the United States, 1.6 million, which makes Americans still involved locally, regionally, nationally, internationally involved in their destiny. One out of 10 Americans, I've said this before, if not on this show, in some other uh, interview, one out of 10 or 11 Americans work for nonprofit organizations. Annually, $350 billion is given to philanthropy in this country and charity. Half of it, of course, goes to religious organizations and others. There'll be $20 trillion transfer of intergenerational wealth in the next decade or so, of which $4 trillion may go to of philanthropic purposes. So philanthropy has become primarily, its flagship is America. It sank into ethos of America, encouraging localism, volunteerism, nationalism, everything you want, we're involved in it. So that 
Andrew Carnegie can give 16,000 to McGill universities at the time and result in the discovery of insulin. Now, in Europe, you don't go say, look, I'm going to tell the state, do, don't bother anything. I'm going to, through private philanthropy, to do this. So, but now Europe is moving towards our direction. As a matter of fact, in the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, there are European now foundation centers and so forth. We are in many ways teaching them that when something comes locally, don't wait for somebody to come to rescue, but you have to do it. Naturally, health and others are big issues. No, not enough of private wealth can take care of them, except doing some research, which we're doing, founding universities, which John D. Rockefeller did, University of Chicago, the uh, Rockefeller family, Rockefeller University, which is doing lots of research, uh, Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. So this nonprofit sector or independent sector, it's more than nonprofit sector, is part and parcel of American ethos. So much so that even since we're entering into a presidential campaign, mark my word, right before election, every presidential candidate will issue his level of his or her uh, philanthropic giving. It's expected of presidential candidates to show how good an American they are by indicating the record of their giving. Whether it will be religious organizations or charitable organizations, they have to give. And most of the giving also of these foundations, uh, uh, actually most of giving, comes not from the wealth to do alone, but also some 70% of it comes from people less than, uh, less than $50,000, $60,000 income. Because it, ethos of giving is part of American psyche now. Now, what role do, do our income tax, uh, does our income tax structure play in this? Well, uh, people in the past speculated that foundations were created in order to avoid taxation or to invest in their egos and so forth. But most of the thing, people we're discussing, John D. Rockefeller, uh, Andrew Carnegie, Fisk, and many others, did it before there was income tax. They did it ironically because we've dismissed some of these people as vain people, as uh, uh, egocentric people. They may have been, but they were also very thoughtful people. They read about America. They read about how our society can be reorganized. Otherwise, uh, foundations become uh, mu mu uh, mausoleums for them, for glory. But it's not the case. Andrew Carnegie was a very well-read person. So much so, and had such a <laughs> chutzpah, I should use, since I'm near New York, uh, he tried to reform English language. Can you imagine this billionaire uh, wanted to simplify English language? So whenever we publish something of his, like we get corrections as if we're mistaken. Why should have as H-A-V-E at the end? Have, H-A-V, alone. Tot, T-O-T, tot, rather than T-O-U-G-H-T. He tried to simplify. He was interested in everything. He was interested in democracy, education being foundation and pillar of democracy, and at the same time, democracy being about citizenship rather than a taxpayer. Taxpayer is not a great thing. Your taxpayer is wonderful for you, but you be, you're a taxpayer because you're a citizen. You're enjoying the rights of this country and oblig you have obligations for this country. So Andrew Carnegie, at the same time, uh, wanted people to become citizens, conscious citizens, and help this democracy to succeed. Now, how can you, of all people, leave out the question of libraries? Well, libraries were the vehicles for educating public. In addition to uh, libraries, which you know very well, some 5,000 around the world libraries and 2,600 or so in this country, he also, believe it or not, gave away 7,000 church organs because he even went to that level of detail that people who go to church may not understand, may be bored, understand subtleties of a sermon, long sermon given by the priest or minister, 
but they would never miss the importance of organ to lift their spirits, masses. Recently, somebody from England told me they have several thousand organs that he also gave in England for the churches and others. So during the centennial, I've been thinking how under the aegis of Carnegie Hall, we may give an organ recital in one of the largest churches or synagogues, wherever that we can find, and invite people to see how over 10,000 organs in the, every Sunday, if they still uh, play organ in churches and synagogues, they could praise glory Andrew of Carnegie. God, <laughs> thanks to Andrew Carnegie's munificence. Fatan, how uh, weighty is his hand on Carnegie Corporation today and the other Carnegie? Okay, it's a wonderful question you ask because I just had to wrestle with this uh, in another conference. I came from Phoenix. He said words to this effect. I believe in perpetual continuation of my foundations in order to meet the needs of the times. So I trust trustees to pursue and adapt as those needs rise. They may not be always right. They may be even wrong. But sooner or later, later when you have wealth, people may rise the occasion, people who come in the ranks, to rise the occasion to justice to what wealth will create. No dead hand then. No dead hand. Maybe dead man you can get out, but no dead hand to, because he was visionary. He thought of everything. He thought of the fact that you can fail and you learn from your failure. Unfortunately, many foundations in the past and even the present, they don't think scientific, scientifically. In a sense, in science, you do something, you don't succeed. That's a learning process. Failure is a learning process, not as a ha making a habit of it, but learning not to repeat of it. And Andrew Carnegie was fully cognizant of that. So one of the first, we, uh, Carnegie is one of the first foundations, if not the first, to have annual report. Also believed in transparency because ha foundations have to enjoy public's trust. They should know what you're doing. Do you think they do in this country today? To do what? enjoy the public's trust? Well, uh, during times of uh, crisis, economic crisis, there are three institutions get attacked or questioned. One is our higher education. They don't teach well, they don't teach at all, and uh, how many hours they are spending in the classroom. Until you say, how many lawyers are in courtroom, how many hours? They say, we're preparing workload. But one can argue this, but that's not. You want some targets to criticize for economic times. Universities are one. Second, foundations, they're tax exempt. Why can't we tax all of them? Government can do a better job than they're doing, which is an easy way of divert, att divert attention from all the problems. And the third one is, naturally, uh, how our youth has become indifferent, ignorant, and so forth. Years ago, when I was provost of the University of Pennsylvania, I welcomed the 50th reunion class, and I read a charge, how this generation is uncaring, lousy, and so forth, so on, so on, and they were all nodding. I said, this was editorial 50 years ago in your newspaper about your complaint about modern youth. Those three forces or three occasions detract attention, become good targets. But nobody approached them scientifically. They do. Because governments cannot uh, experiment. No politician would like to be in having authorized something that failed. Foundations are there to experiment, to think ahead, to demonstrate, and then save effort in order to allow governments to see which ones they could be able to adapt without possibility of failure. And that's why early childhood, for example, our foundation for 30 years contributed to the study of early childhood. So it became part of American educational mantras, early childhood, and government and every politician voted. And that's the role is to demonstrate 
to prove and then to give it as a gift to the nation or organizations to be able to build around it. So foundations have an independent mission in many ways that complements, does not compete with governments. Question. We just have two minutes left. Uh, and then you promised you'll sit there and we'll do another program. Uh, what grade would you give the great foundations of this country today? I will give B. What happened to the A? Well, A uh, is individual foundations. I'll give some of them A. Collectively, we have to be able to collaborate. That's a new phenomenon for foundations to collaborate. And we have to find ways in which to collaborate. You're saying you haven't as yet. We have tried. Yes, we have success. We have successful the last couple of years. Many foundations collaborating. But it's not in the nature of the foundation to collaborate. Because you have your own mission. You have your own board. You have your own presidents. They all have to succeed. Somehow, in the past, like universities, very little cooperation among universities in the past. Now they're trying, some of them compete. Because when you collaborate, people think you're weak. Otherwise, why would you collaborate? Other is getting. But ironically, we're collaborating more with foreign universities than with each other. Foreign universities are a prestige that I am relationship with Beijing. But if I have relation with Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, and so forth, they would say, I don't have good English department. I'm trying to compliment. I don't have Indian. But you know, as a professor, you yourself know this. Co collaboration is number one necessity now among foundations. Because it doesn't matter who does it, who gets credit. What's to be done is more important because our nation's needs are a lot. And we cannot afford waste. And that's the point at which we end this program. And I ask you not to move so that we can do the next program immediately. Thanks, Vartan Gregorian. You're welcome. Me. Thank you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. <clears throat> I hope you join us again next time as well. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to reprise this program online right now or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 or so other open mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.